Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 9 for Money in Schools. We're going to look at school infrastructure in this chapter. I want to stress that a lot of this stuff is district level specific. So I've cut a lot here. This is a quick slideshow, only about 22 slides. I don't expect this to be a long lecture. I'm only going to cover stuff that's building specific and important for you. As normal, I present with you the chapter drivers. You can look at these on your own, um, but these are the main objectives that we'll be looking at for this particular chapter. So one of the things that you have to know is that infrastructure is handled at the district level. The board makes the decisions, the superintendent makes the decisions, but nobody knows what's good and bad about the school more than the building principal. They're there 50 and 60 hours a week, 12 months out of the year, six, five, six days a week. So when a district involves, allows building level involvement for infrastructure, principals stay happy because it gives them control and it helps them as well. So that's a big consideration. So the size of the district dis dictates how infrastructure is run. There's, in some districts, you're gonna actually have a team of people that handle fiscal planning, um, that handle your infrastructure planning, that are your property plant equipment people. Some districts are not. It's gonna be the superintendent or the building principal. This is normally, you know, in, since it's a major expenditure, the person's very connected with the school board to make the decisions and to move things forward. So consider that as well. So, Infrastructure is normally the school plant and the school facilities. The key thing is that needs that the school has outweighs the resources. So if the school needs something, that comes before something that can be a surplus for school improvement. So those of you that have a business background, you're familiar with OSHA. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, and the and IDA is also responsible for basically telling you how schools should look and be accommodating to students. Um, we have issues because populations have shifted. Remember, you know, when we talked about the history of schools and we spoke about the baby boomer population, the average American family has 2.4 children. About 50, 60 years ago, parents were having four and five kids, and 50 years prior to that, parents were having 10 to 12 kids. So your older buildings have more space. Your newer buildings don't, but as population shifts, you have to expand the building to account for the population. So national population and trends and how many people are having kids and more people are moving to do make a difference. So it's important to note that every state funds infrastructure differently. This is done at the state level, not at the federal uh, level. Um, as of the publication of this textbook, only eight states do not provide support for infrastructure. States that don't are left you know, to the local cost share, which is normally a major expense out of local tax dollars. Um, so local property taxes, really, you know, that's, that's where the local cost share is funded. Um, basically what happens with local property taxes, what can be a good thing and a bad thing, there's ownership involved with it. If you're paying taxes to live in a wealthier district, you feel like you're entitled to more in your school. So they have, so people that are involved in this feel entitled of how local funds should be spent. So we'll talk about different ways that that can be an issue related to revenues, sinking funds, bonds, that sort of thing. So most of the time, local districts have to supplement aid that's received. Um, basically, the revenue system in our state is pay as you go. Um, which really helps the wealthier and more affluent school districts. If they need something and they can afford it, quite frankly, they get it. The poorer school districts and the rural school districts, they don't. So few districts you know, will use this model, the current revenue model, um, especially if they're larger mid-size. Now your smaller districts, they can do pay-as-you-go because they know what they need, they know what their population is going to be, and in a lot of cases the principal might even serve as the superintendent as well. So your sinking funds idea, this is basically giving you a savings account. You put money into it every year. It's part of your budget. And then when you have a sum of money, then you use it for an infrastructure project. Um, this will allow you to levy a tax. And then you can spend the money when it's ready to be spent. When you have a higher interest gained, 
that's awesome too because then you're gaining interest on the money you're investing which will give you more money to use for school districts so with a sinking funds balance if you can wait 10 to 15 years and let the funds build up that's going to help you as well so bonded indebtedness um, you're permitted to incur long-term debt um, and then investors come in and they purchase the debt off of you and then you're bound to the to the debtor I have issues with this um, as a researcher because I don't like the notion that there's so much turnover and personnel turnover between superintendent and principal that you kind of come, you might come into a situation as a building principal that's, that's been bonded and there's been issues and there's been problems and you're stuck with whatever decisions are made. By the time you're close to getting it straight, straightened out, you're moving on to another district, you're getting promoted. So you're not going to be there for 20 years in most cases to see this. So you have to make decisions related to bonds that can improve interest rates, refinance and restructure, so the debt isn't as bad as it might be. So um, every district has different needs, every building has different needs. One of the things that we found, you know, me coming from the Northeast, was we have a massive asbestos problem in the Northeast. A lot of the buildings, we have school buildings that still exist that people can't use because of asbestos, and they're just hanging out. Nobody's destroyed them because of concerns and fears of asbestos. Um, older buildings don't have good electric. They don't have inadequate ventilation. Um, that can cause problems with management of the buildings. Um, and overcrowding, in, overcrowded buildings increase elect electrical costs as well. The first thing that a district will do if there's a huge migration of population, they'll invest in trailers and they'll start teaching in trailers. Then they'll turn the gym or the cafeteria into an all-purpose room, they'll put dividers up, and they'll have classes that exist in the gym and the cafeteria. Now, think about if you're working in a, in a district where the gym and the cafeteria are the same thing. That's an even worse of a problem because then now you're out of classroom space, you're out of gym space, you're out of cafeteria space. So that can happen if a district becomes overcrowded. So we're going to talk about the six needs in a building, um, and this is important as well. We'll go over each one of these one at a time. Um, infrastructure has to be done based on the school population you're serving. Um, I think that means comfortable chairs and desks. Um, one of the things that is interesting for me right now, walking around this campus, is the number of desks that exist in these older buildings that are these one-armed desks that you know were from the 40s and 50s, where you know you basically have to lay your hand on the desk and you have to write on it. And imagine that for a child that's in a classroom. The way that our rooms are set up, you know, where we have tables, um, comfortable desks, comfortable chairs, that's worth the investment. It lets kids feel comfortable and it's going to increase their learning and motivation in school. I couldn't imagine kids sitting in these rooms with these stupid old desks. Um, but the problem is that's not always possible. Um, you have to forecast your demographics of the district and that's why that's something that I want you to do as part of this class. I want you to give me an idea if you think you're, if, if your district is growing, if your district is shrinking, if your district could merge with another, another district, if there's consolidation issues. I want you to talk a little bit, bit about that and tell me about that. So transportation is a big deal in rural districts. Um, I come from Pennsylvania where we have these very highly populated areas. I grew up in the city, but I also am familiar with rural districts and rural areas as well. There's a county that exists in Pennsylvania, Beaver County. Um, you can look it up. It's a fascinating county because it's spread out so much that there are some children that have to go 45 minutes, catch two buses to get to high school. Because of that, a lot of them switch to cyber schools. That particular county, their funding is down significantly, and the neighboring counties, uh, Butler County and Lawrence County, have to actually give money to Beaver to sustain their public school system. Um, this affects attendance, and if you're getting money based on attendance, and kids don't want to catch two buses to go to school, parents are going to say, I don't want to send my kids to school, and they're not going to do it. Should kids have to be on a bus for an hour to go to school? I don't think so. But this is why the big idea is in your rural districts, if you can afford community schools, you do the community school model, you have a joint middle and high school that it is centrally located in the district. The high school and middle school should be as centrally located as possible. So program offerings impacts facilities. Some districts value athletics over everything else. Some value STEM, some value art and music, some value vocational and technical education. 
you have to plan your facility to account for this. If you're going to be in a district that's going to offer iPods to every student, well, there better be a good Wi-Fi plan. I worked with a district when I was in Pennsylvania that gave a laptop computer, a Mac, to every single student that was in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, but their internet service could not handle the Mac. So basically what happened, the students would come in, they would play solitaire, and they weren't using the computers for what they were supposed to be using it. Um, so you need to make sure that the infrastructure supports what your mission of the district and the building is. If your district has a history of athletics and it's a big deal, you improve the athletic facilities because then that's going to bring more people into the district and that's going to grow it. A lot of people will stand up here in the lecture in, in your education classes and say athletics don't matter. Athletics do matter. If you have a, a long, deep-rooted history of a successful athletic program, it's going to cause people to move into your district, it's going to increase the tax revenue, it's going to increase the tax base, and that's going to help. Now, if you're in a district where you think you have a strong athletic program and consistently lose all the time, that's a different story. But the athletic program, if it's, if it's positive and it does recruit people into the district, you need to use that because that can help increase your revenue, it can increase your tax base, and that can help you as well. So long-range facility needs, I've said this a billion times, you know, we're talking about long-range procedures. If there are new babies in the school district, um, driving around the areas outside of Tulsa so far, um, I've seen all these massive housing plants, and I hope to eventually live in one of these beautiful housing plants because they're amazing. Um, that tells me that in these districts, there are going to be a lot of new babies. When there are new babies in a district, you don't have to worry about them for five years, but they're coming. And then you have to have space for them, meaning you have to hire more kindergarten teachers. Then the next year, you hire more first grade teachers, then second grade teachers. Are you seeing that everything related to budgeting really has to do with staffing, population, and hiring? It's, I think it's the most important thing in schools. You might have a population of senior citizens that's huge in your district, and they pay their taxes, but let's be realistic. Senior citizens aren't going to be there forever, and then you lose your tax base. So sometimes you have people that can't pay taxes. Then you don't get the money. Um, this state infrastructure is tied to taxes, so this is important. If people can't pay, then you can't play. So. Some of the other ideas, you know, the organizational structure. How many buildings are in the district? Is there a comprehensive high school and middle school? And if so, that should be where your highest salaried employees are. Um, that should be where your main, you know, your central office needs to be close to that. Um, that fiscal and organizational structure has to be strong. If there are a lot of elementary schools, does that mean that they're subscribing to the community schools model or they're just there for a purpose? Can the district consolidate their buildings? If you're claiming you have 10 elementary schools and you're using a community schools model but you're really not, that could be an issue as well. Um, and you need to look at the teacher-student ratio in the district and in each building as well. So are there businesses coming in that can support the tax base? Um, that's big because then these are people that you can partner with. We're going to talk about later on in the course um, the fact that advertising is legal in this state. Um, you can put advertising on, on on billboards and related to the school, and that can provide the school with money. Um, are there migrant workers who are going to come in and not pay taxes? Is the district growing or shrinking? Um, should you build a new building or should you refurbish it? These are other things you need to consider as well. So um, leaders that understand what maintenance looks like are going to be successful. Leaders that don't understand what maintenance looks like hire strong custodians who can at least tell you when something's wrong. Um, they can help you. If you understand the facilities, they can help you when problems exist, and that can avoid problems and help you interact with your staff and provide a good learning environment. So that's it. This is a quick chapter. A lot of this is district level. We're going to talk about transportation and food services next. Um, that's another quick chapter. If there's anything else I can do to help, as always, you know, please let me know. Thank you.